Welcome to this YSL tutorial. In this video, we're going to look at DML or Data Manipulation Language triggers in Microsoft SQL Server. We'll begin the video with a quick look at what triggers actually are and how DML triggers fit into the bigger picture. We'll then look at the data manipulation events that you can attach your triggers to, and then show you the difference between an after trigger and an instead of trigger. When we've covered the basics, we'll look at how you can use the inserted and deleted tables to get access to the data that your triggers might work on, and finally we'll show you a practical example of using triggers and inserted tables to validate the data that's being added to your database. So let's get started. In SQL Server, a trigger is a special kind of stored procedure that you can attach to various events which happen in your database. They come in three main flavours. There's DML, or Data Manipulation Language Triggers. There are DDL, or Data Definition Language Triggers. And then finally, there are Logon Triggers. In this video, we're going to focus on the DML Triggers. And as I've already mentioned, it stands for Data Manipulation Language. That basically corresponds to three main events that can happen in your database. These are the Insert, Update, and Delete events. And these events are associated with tables or views in your database, and the DML triggers can be attached to either a table or a view, and they can be one of two types. They can be either an after or an instead of trigger. And this video is going to explain how all of that works. We'll start by showing you how you can create basic DML triggers attached to a table. Before you create a trigger, you need to decide which table or view in your database you want to attach it to. And in this example, we're going to attach a trigger to the actor table in our movies database. There's a couple of ways to achieve adding a trigger to a table. One way is to find the table in the tables folder, expand the table itself, and find the triggers folder. You can then right click on the folder and choose new trigger, and that will create a page of horrible looking system generated code. What you would have to do now is you would have to modify this code to make it fit the trigger that you wanted to create. Personally, I prefer not to do that. I'm going to close this window down, and instead I'm going to create a brand new blank query window. And in this window, I can write out the code that will create my trigger. I'll begin with a use statement to make sure that we're working in the correct database, and go to ensure that the next statement will be the first one in a batch. And then this is the simple statement that you can use to create a trigger. Uh, literally, create trigger, followed by whatever name you want your trigger to have. I'm going to start mine with, with the letters TRG to indicate that it's a trigger, and I'm going to call it actors changed. Following that, you need to say which table or view the, the, the trigger is created for, and you do that with an on statement. So we say on TBL actor in this case. After this, you have to decide whether your trigger will be an after trigger or an instead of trigger. As I mentioned very briefly earlier on, an after trigger will run immediately after the events you set it for, and an instead of trigger will run in place of the events. In this case, we're going to use an after trigger, and following this keyword, you list out which events you want the trigger to handle. So, for instance, if I only wanted to handle the insert event for this table, I could say after insert but I can actually extend this to handle two or three events. So if I wanted this to handle any data change event in my entire actors table, I could add on uh, the word update, followed by the word delete, separated by commas, and this trigger will handle every single data modification event in that table. Final couple of keywords to add, the word as, and it's useful to have a begin and an end statement, followed by the word go. And inside the begin and end block, we can actually write out what we want our trigger to do. This one's not going to be very complicated at all. In fact, all it's going to do is print a message to the messages window to tell us that something has happened in the actors table. So we're going to use a print statement um, and say something happened to the actor table very, very simply. OK, so all we need to do now is execute the code to create the trigger itself. And when we do that, we should see the nice message commands completed successfully. So now that we've created the trigger, we need some way to test that it works. And basically, in order to do that, we need to trigger one of these three events, either insert some records into the actor table, update a record in there, or delete something. I've actually written a bit of code already, here's one I prepared earlier, to, uh, to do exactly that. So um, I've turned off the row counts just to tidy up the output so we can see a little bit more clearly what's going on. And then three separate 
um, statements basically. One to insert a new record into the outer table, one to update that record, and then another one finally to delete it again. So if I execute that code, what we should see is three messages, one for each event that has caused our trigger to fire. Let's have a quick look at how you could choose to modify your trigger if you wanted to change the way that it worked. Um, if you still have the original code available that you used to create the trigger in the first place, you can easily just head back to it, modify the word create to the word alter, and then maybe change something about your, your what your trigger does. So maybe instead of something happened, I'll put a more, more specific message, data was changed uh, in the act table. There we go. If I execute this code now, it will modify the way that the trigger works. And if I head back to my test code, when I run this one again, I'll see a different message this time. So that's one way to modify a trigger. Just use the original code that you used to create it in the first place. If you've made the mistake and you haven't uh, saved that code or you've, you, you've lost it, you can also get back to changing a trigger through the Object Explorer. So if you expand your databases folder through the actor table and into the triggers folder, you'll see that any triggers you've created will be listed there. Sometimes you might find that you need to refresh this list first. So if you right click the triggers folder and choose to refresh it, anything that wasn't there will appear. Then you can right click the trigger that you want to modify and click the modify option. And that will take you to some system generator code that will allow you to modify the way that it works. If you wanted to delete a trigger rather than modify it, again, there are two different ways to do that. If you head to the Object Explorer window, and again, browse through your database, the Tables folder, the table which contains your trigger, and into the Triggers folder, you can right-click the trigger that you want to remove and choose to delete it. When the dialog box appears, all you need to do then is click the OK button. I'm not going to do that, I'm actually going to show you how you can also write some code to do the same thing. So if I cancel from this dialog box in any query window effectively if I create a brand new blank one and make sure I'm using the correct database so use movies and go I can simply say to drop a trigger if I could spell trigger properly that would help and then the trigger that I've created which was TRG actors changed if I execute this code now the trigger will be removed from the from the table so that means that if I find any sample code that previously showed us this information when data was changed in the actors table if I execute this code now I don't see any such messages because the trigger has been removed. So we've seen an example of a symbol after trigger let's have a look at how to create an instead of trigger as well. You begin in the same way as for creating an after trigger with the words create trigger and then the name that you want your trigger to have I'm going to call this one actor inserted you then say what table you want the trigger to be created on, and again, in our case, it's going to be on the TBL actor. Then you say, rather than after, we say instead of, and then again, we list out which events we want our trigger to be attached to. Previously, we listed uh, insert, update, and delete in a comma-separated list. In this example, I'm only going to attach the trigger to the insert event. Then we have a couple of other keywords to fill in, the as keyword, and we'll have a begin and an end block, and a go statement. And then inside the begin and end block, we can decide what we want our trigger to do. Previously, we used a very simple print statement to print some information to the messages window. In this example, what I'd like to do is use the raise error statement to raise a proper error message to the system. I don't want to get into too much detail about how this statement works. If you're really interested, a quick Google will, will turn up a help page on the Microsoft Developer Network site, um, which explains all about how the raise error statement works. What we're going to do is we're going to provide a custom error message, which is going to say, um, uh, no more actors can be inserted. We're also going to provide a, a, a severity level for our error and also a state. So those are the three values that have to be filled in. And just remember that also you have to enclose the arguments for this statement in a set of parentheses. So there we go. And that is exactly what our, our trigger will do. Whenever anybody tries to insert an, an actor into the actor table, the system will raise an error instead. So I'm going to execute this code to create the trigger. And then what we will need to do is test if it works. So, to test that this trigger does its job, we can run some sample code to try to insert a new actor into the actor's table. So, I've turned off the row counts again, as I did in the previous 
uh, previous example. Then I try to insert an actor into the actor's table, and then I've tried to select the record that I've just inserted, so where the actor's ID is 999, which is the value I've passed into the insert into statement. If I execute this query, what I'll actually see is what looks like a system generated error message. It has an error number, it has a severity level, 16, and a state of 1. It also has our customized error message. No more actors can be inserted. Just to prove that the actor hasn't been inserted into that table, um, this select star from table actor where the actor's ID is 999, if we look at the results panel, we will see that we don't return any records. So that's the difference between an instead of and an after trigger. The instead of trigger completely replaces what the original event would have done. Often it can be useful for your triggers to have access to the data that's been modified in one of the data modification events. And for this reason you've got access to two tables, the inserted table and the deleted table. The inserted table is used in the insert and update events, and the deleted table is used in the delete and update events. To show you how you can quickly use one of those, I'm going to make a modification to the trigger that we created earlier where we're inserting an actor into the actor's table. I'm going to replace the word create with the word alter, and instead of making it an instead of trigger, I'm going to make this an after trigger. I'm going to remove the error message that we, uh, that we raised previously, and I'm going to replace that with a select statement that is going to select everything from a table called inserted. And you can see that the inserted table appears automatically in the IntelliSense list. This is a built-in part of any database. So if I execute this code to modify my trigger, I can then run some sample code that will try to insert a record into the actor's table. So here it is. It's going to insert a new record um, with an ID of 999 into the actor's table. If I execute that code, you can see, although I didn't ask it to select anything in the code that I've written, I see the record that has been inserted listed below. And the reason that's happened is purely because that's what my trigger has been told to do. So there we go. The inserted table shows you any records that have been inserted into the table in the insert event. You can use the inserted table to help you with the validation of data in your database. So what we're going to do to demonstrate that is create a new trigger called uh, TRG cast member added. And we're going to attach that to the cast table and it's going to run after a record is inserted into that table. The idea is that we're trying to make sure that the actor we're assigning to a role is valid. The criteria we're going to use, I've actually made a quick modification to the actor table to include an extra field. So if you look in the list of columns for the actor table, I've actually just included an extra one called actor date of death. It's a little bit of a morbid example. But we're going to record um, when an actor has died, we're going to make sure that we don't then try to assign them to a new role in a new film. So if I have a quick look at the data stored in that table, we've got our new actor inserted from a previous example. And the ID number is 999 and I've set the date of death for that actor to today's date. None of the other actors have a date of death inserted, so it's just that single one. What we're going to do is write our trigger so that it checks if the ID of the actor that's included in the inserted table matches an actor whose date of death is not null. Then we're going to stop um, allowing the user to add that actor to that particular role. So, to make my trigger work, I need to check whether the actor whose ID I'm inserting into the cast table has his or her date of death filled in. And to do that, I'm going to use an if exists within my trigger. Inside a set of parentheses, what I'm going to do then is write a simple select statement. So I'm going to select everything from TBL actor. I'm going to give, going to give that an alias as A. And I'm going to join that too with an inner join. I'm going to join it to the inserted table. Um, and I'm going to give that an alias as I. The fields that I'm going to join on are a.actorid, and I'm going to check whether that is equal to i.castActorID. All I need to do now is add a where clause to the query to check where actor data death is not null. So that if statement will return true if the actor whose, whose ID I'm inserting into the cast table has his data death filled in. What do I want to do if that is true? Well, I'm going to write a begin and end block below my if statement because there's several actions I'd like to perform. 
First of all, as we saw earlier on, I'm going to raise an error message to the system. And the error that I'm going to raise is going to have a message of something like, uh, sorry, um, that actor has expired. It's a bit of a morbid example, but there we go. I'm going to give it a severity of 16 and a state of 1. What I'd also like to do is make sure that the, the insert doesn't carry through. So I want to make sure I've rolled back my transaction that will be occurring at that point. We've got separate videos on uh, on transactions, so if you're not sure about what transactions mean, roughly speaking, it cancels the insert. Um, we've got a much more detailed video that explains that in a lot more, uh, more detail. Um, Finally, what I'd also like to do is return at that point. So I want this entire um, uh, procedure to be ended at that point. So what I should be able to do now is execute this script to create that trigger. And all that remains is for me to test that it works in the way I've intended. OK, so here we are ready to test our trigger. And I'm going to try to insert a new record into the cast table. I should assign some not quite random values, but a new ID number for the cast ID, which I have to provide. The first actor that I'm going to try to insert is actually one who does exist and who is not uh, deceased. So uh, Tom Cruise has actor ID number one, and I'm going to insert him into film number 333, which happens to be um, the, the latest Star Trek movie, Star Trek Into Darkness, and he's going to be inserted with a cast with a role of a random red shirt. So because Tom Cruise is date of death is currently null. The system will allow me to insert him as a cast member into this film. If I execute this query, everything will work exactly as intended. What happens now if I modify, first of all, I'll, I'll add another value to the cast ID. And instead of inserting Tom Cruise into the role, what I'm now going to do is insert actor number 999, which, if you remember briefly from earlier on, I showed you was the new actor that I we, we just sort of a generic one that we made up. The ID number is 999, and clearly the date of death field is not null. So if I try to execute this same script now to insert the new actor, I will actually get a an error message. So we see the custom error message we, we created, sorry that actor has expired, and we can see that the transaction that I rolled back has been aborted. So that actor does not end up, that role does not end up being created because the actor has expired. So, as I say, it's a little bit of a, a morbid example, but hopefully you can see how you could use triggers to enforce your business logic, your, your validation rules. You can use the inserted table to check whether the values that are being inserted into your tables match criteria based on values contained in other tables. And that's something that you can't do using simple validation rules. So hopefully that gives you a nice overview of how basic triggers work in SQL Server. Hope you've enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this training video, you can find many more online training resources at www.wisel.co.uk.